Thanks. It's always a pleasure to visit Champagne. <laughs> Uh, especially, uh, I'm especially glad to be speaking about this here because this is all joint work with Brian Benson, formerly a graduate student here, and this was work that was initiated here maybe two or three years ago. So definitely an Illinois project. Okay, so uh, throughout this talk, G will be a discrete subgroup of PSL to R, uh, and it will be discrete, non-co-compact, just to make things easier, and co finite. But possibly distortion? Uh, yes, exactly. So uh, M will be the, the surface you get by quotienting the hyperbolic plane by G. That will be a non compact hyperbolic surface with cusps and possibly cone points. Okay, so then the Chiga constant of such a thing uh, which is denoted H of M. By the way, if anyone knows why it's denoted H, I'd love to know. Because that's how Chiga denotes it in his original paper. Um, but this is little h of M, and what it is is it's an infimum over subsets E of M of the length of E. divided by the minimum of the area of A and the area of B, where E varies over dimension one submanifolds or subsets. Maybe I don't necessarily want it to be a manifold, uh, which separate M into pieces A and B. So this is, roughly speaking, a measure of how much M has a, a bottleneck or bottlenecks. And so the cartoon that you sometimes see for an example of something with a very small Chiga constant looks something like this. So this is a genus two surface where I've chosen a separating curve and shrunk the length to be very small. And so if you have this, then you have two pieces. This one has area 2 pi. It's a punctured torus. And this one also has area 2 pi. So if you give me some small epsilon, I can pinch this curve to be smaller than 2 pi epsilon in length. And then the quotient here is less than 2 pi epsilon over 2 pi. So 2 pi epsilon over, strictly speaking, the minimum of 2 pi and 2 pi, which is 2 pi. So this is epsilon. So you can always find a hyperbolic surface with a Chiga constant as small as you like. Now, because this is an infimum, it's beyond examples like this where you've sort of pre-engineered the Chiga constant to be what you want it to be. Beyond that, it's hard to compute. And part of the point of the talk is, so far we don't know of any non-trivial Chiga constants. So in other words, you just give me a, an arbitrary hyperbolic surface, arbitrary Fuchsian group. How do you compute the Chiga constant? So this is the first example, or the first examples that we know of, of a sort of non-trivial computation of a Chiga constant. OK, so other quantities that I want to talk about. So lambda 1 of m is going to be the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian. And I'm going to do my best to not make any assertions about lambda 1, because I've made that mistake before. The point is, lambda 1 and h are 
very much intertwined via these inequalities. The theorem is that you can sandwich lambda 1, which is, a, again, a quantity that depends somewhat on the geometry of the surface, between these two bounds. And so the point of these inequalities is meant to say that, well, if one of these things goes to 0, then it brings the other one with it to a certain extent. Right? If, if you've got a sequence of manifolds where h is going to 0, then lambda 1 has to go to 0 too, and vice versa. So these inequalities, this one's due to Cheeger in 1970, and this one's due to Peter Boozer in 1982. So the point is, I'm going to state some theorems that mention lambda 1. We are proving things about the Cheeger constant partly because we want to really say things about lambda 1, but lambda 1 is a sort of less explicitly geometric quantity, so we're going to be trying to estimate lambda 1 via h. Okay, so uh, a couple of arithmetic preliminaries. Okay, so I've specifically chosen my groups to be non-co-compact. Part of the reason I'm doing that is to make this definition easy. So G is going to be arithmetic if it is commensurable. with PSL2z. In other words, G and PSL2z share a finite index subgroup in common. So there's a theorem from Heinz Helling in the 60s which characterizes such subgroups. And what this theorem basically says is, well, clearly finite index subgroups of PSL2z satisfy this condition. Well, if you're not a subgroup of PSL2z and you are arithmetic and not compact, then it turns out you have to look like this. So the theorem says that such G is either a finite index subgroup or a finite index subgroup of these maximal groups. So this notation means gamma 0, which I'll define in a second, of this number n, which is a square free integer, and what we're doing is we're taking the normalizer of this thing in PSL2R. That turns out to be a finite uh, area surface or a, a finite, a co-finite area group. And so this gamma 0 of n is all the elements of PSL2z such that c is congruent to 0 mod n. So this, the theorem says okay, if you're not a finite index subgroup of PSL2z, then you have to either be one of these or a finite index in one of these. OK. So then. These are sometimes called a type of congruent subgroup because this is a congruence condition that we're satisfying. Um, in general, G is called congruence if it contains some gamma of n, which is all the matrices in PSL2z. such that uh, A and D are both congruent to 1, and B and C are both congruent to 0 mod n. So in other words, the matrix is congruent to the identity mod n. Okay, and then one last preliminary. So given gamma, element of PSL2R. So how do you interpret this definition in terms of the center? And, and 
PSLPG versus Oh, because t uh, you mean technically the yeah. matrix minus one, zero, zero, minus one is in there too? Yeah. Do you think about this? Um, well, if you really want, you can do this. <laughs> 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 um, well, or perhaps I should do this. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get away with one there. So, yeah, so um, you take things that are congruent to plus or minus the NMC. Okay. Yeah, so plus the NMC or minus the NMC. And uh, okay. yeah, yeah. And then when you project divides, I think everything's fine. Okay, so uh, given an arbitrary element gamma in PSL2R, with uh, the magnitude of the trace bigger than two, so it's a hyperbolic element, then if the axis of gamma projects to a, a closed geodesic on M, which it may not, we'll see examples where it doesn't in, uh, in later on in the talk. If it does, then the uh, length of the geodesic is determined by the trace of the element by the equation uh, 2 arc cosh of the magnitude of the trace divided by 2. So in other words, the larger the trace, since this is increasing, the larger the length and vice versa. So the larger the length, the larger the trace. And because of this, I, I'm, I'm warning you in advance, I'm probably going to say words like a geodesic of trace three. When I say a geodesic of trace three, I mean a geodesic that corresponds to a hyperbolic element of trace three, and which therefore has length two arc cosh three over two. If I say that, I'm warning you in advance, that's what it means. Okay. So that's the preliminaries. Any questions so far? All right. OK, so the next section is basically why I'm interested in computing the Chino constant. And um, the first reason is due to the connection with reflection groups. So a hyperbolic reflection group is just going to be the group generated by reflections in a hyperbolic polygon. Yeah, so I am going to require it's discrete. And of course, that corresponds to all the angles being either 0 at an ideal vertex or a submultiple of pi. So OK, so that's a hyperbolic reflection group. Now. There are infinitely many hyperbolic reflection groups in dimension two. You can see that by just taking your favorite polygon with all right angles and then doubling it across the side. The result is a larger polygon with more vertices, which are all pi over two. And you can just keep going this. So there are infinitely many of these. So what people started doing was started adding adjectives to the start of this definition until you could prove there were finitely many. So, so arithmetic, I've already defined. So given a reflection group, it's not going to be orientation preserving, but it's going to be arithmetic if and only if its orientation preserving subgroup is arithmetic. So such a group is arithmetic if and only if its 
so-called rotation subgroup. So this is just the index two orientation preserving subgroup. And for this reason, I'm mostly going to assume I'm actually dealing with this orientation preserving subgroup rather than the actual reflection group. OK, so arithmetic is an adjective you can put here, and you still have infinitely many, even in dimension two. So the next adjective we put um, is that an arithmetic hyperbolic reflection group is maximal if it is not contained in another reflection group. So notice we're only taking a group to be maximal here if it's maximal with respect to the probability to the property yeah, property of being a reflection group. So in other words, these reflection groups can be contained in larger groups that are not generated by reflections. And that's a theme we'll develop. So in other words, it can be a maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection group. Well, if a right-angled Artin group is a rag, can we coin the term mar marg, marg <laughs> for, for these things? Uh, but the point is, the point is it can be a maximal reflection group without being a maximal group, maximal lattice. So therein lies the actual, uh, the interesting theory that we'll get to later. Is it clear that they exist? Is it clear that my, uh, is it? like doubling of your polygon right angle. Like right, but so doubling, doubling actually creates a subgroup. Right, so it creates a larger, so, so the, these maximal groups are going to correspond to the minimal area surfaces. So you're right, you can keep going and keep just doubling and go forever, and that's partly why there's infinitely many of these things. And um, I mean, you can construct examples where you can prove that you can't subdivide anymore. And basically, you, know, you, you want to appeal to the fact that these orbifolds that you get, they have volume bounded below. You can't have a sequence of these lattices whose volume goes to zero, area goes to zero. So that basically tells you, you, can't, you can only go so far. OK. So now we can add an extra adjective here and talk about maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups. And of these, there are finitely many. So the theorem is there are only finitely many maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups. And this theorem is due to a bunch of people. So in dimension two, it's long. McLaughlin and Reed, published in 06. In Dimension 3, it's due to Egel, also published in 06. And in general, N, uh, it's due to Egel, Bello Lipetsky, Bello Lipetsky, Peter Storm, and White uh, in 08. And part of, the, part of the argument here is that these things do not exist above a certain dimension. Uh, dimension 30, for example. I think it might be lower, but certainly above dimension 30. You mean they don't exist at all? They don't exist at all, yeah. The original theorem in that vein was proved in the early 80s, and I think the number was 996. So they, they don't exist in dimension above 1,000, but that number has come down significantly since. 
So the point is they only exist in dimensions up to possibly 30, and in each dimension where they exist, there are finitely many. Okay, so <coughs> there's finitely many of these things. So since there are only finitely many, you might hope to classify them, write them all down, or at least explore how you might do that. And the, uh, the argument for why all of these things are really finite, all of these arguments are based on volume bounds. They, they all rest on theorems that say maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups have to have bounded volume or bounded area. And those arguments are always proved using lambda 1. And for that reason, if you can say something about lambda 1 for these maximal groups, you can get hopefully effective bounds on the volumes of these things and hope to count them. So we are aiming to bound lambda 1. The general aim is lower bounds For these things. So So the, uh, the ideal result that we would like in the context of congruence things is that if G is congruence, then lambda 1 of G, by which I mean lambda 1 of the manifold or orbifold quotient, so lambda 1 of H2 mod G, is bigger than 1 fourth. Now that's only a conjecture still but some results have been proven in this direction. So, my parents might be watching, so I'm not gonna dare pronounce this. <laughs> my mom, my mom's a French teacher, she'd have a fit. But anyway, in the 80s, this person proved that uh, for congruence, so for congruence arithmetic lattices, lambda 1 is bounded below by 3 sixteenths. And the, I guess the most recent work in this direction that I could find is that Kim and Sarnak proved that you can improve it slightly to 975 over 4,096. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> well, that, 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 <laughs> that's closer to 1 fourth than 3 sixteenths, so it's actually a non trivial improvement. <laughs> it's non trivial to check that it's better. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 th this will turn out to be actually quite useful. Hopefully, I'll get to why in the end. Um, Okay, so because of these um, because of these lower bounds on lambda one, a very reasonable question to ask would be: Is it true that these finitely many maximal groups have the property that they are all congruents, so that you can say this about them? So the question that Bela Lipetsky asked in 2010 is: Is every maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection group congruence in this sense. And so that's the question that I answered the following year by actually constructing some of these things explicitly and the answer turns out to be no. In fact, uh, I found the 23 non-co-compact examples in dimension two. So of the 23 
examples which are not co-compact. Dimension two. Well, the first thing to say is 13 of them have their rotation subgroup being one of the normalizers of these things. Remember, those things were the maximal lattices. And furthermore, notice that if you satisfy this congruence condition, you certainly satisfy this. And so everything that's in here is in here. And so all of these maximal lattices are congruence. So 13 of these 23 correspond to these normalizers for a list of n that I won't write down. And hence our congruence. And of the other 10, well, all the other 10 are index 2 in these guys. But of the 10 of them, eight of them are not congruence. So you can look at this a couple ways. So total 15 out of the 23 are congruent. So you might say, well, that's good. That's you know, more than 2 thirds. Not quite, not quite 2 thirds, but roughly 2 thirds. So that might be good. But on the other hand, uh, one, another way to look at this is these 13 are forced to be congruent because they contain one of these guys, and therefore they contain one of these guys. Of the ones that don't have that property, eight out of 10 of those ones are not congruent. So if you're not forced to be congruent by being actually a maximal lattice on the nose, you tend towards being not congruent. So this is an interesting, I think this is an interesting result. And we want to study these eight examples in, in particular to see whether their geometry is wildly different from the geometry of the congruence guys. Um, it's not always different topological data. Um, some of them are the same. And I'll give you some examples at the end. The point is, if they have the same topological data, they have different geometric data. So the distances between the cone points, for example, will be different. Yeah, so you really have to, if you really want to study the geometry of these things, you have to find fundamental domains and start getting to work with the, you know, the actual groups themselves. So these things of minimal area that not have this property, do they fail to be arithmetic? No, they're arithmetic. They just fail to be uh, maximal arithmetic groups in the sense that they're, they correspond to these normalizers. So the way you look for these things, or the way I looked for these things here, is what I did is I looked at the normalizers. Some of them are reflective in the sense that all the sides of a fundamental domain are paired exactly symmetrically, in which case you can have the fundamental domain and say this is the group of reflections in this polygon. And some of them are symmetric, but the pairings are not done symmetrically, in which case that this thing here is not a, ref a reflection group. But you can go looking for finite index subgroups that are reflection groups. And in this case, you know, in these 10 cases, they all possess an index 2 subgroup that is the orientation preserving subgroup of a reflection group. Uh, this should become a bit more apparent when I get to an example. OK. So I should stress, all of these are index 2 subgroups in some group of this form. OK. So section 3, is, this is a very brief section. The fact is, what we have here is groups that are clearly congruent that possess index 2 subgroups that are not congruent. And so since we're going to be studying the geometry of that, it's actually relevant to the following theorem of Buzer and Sarnak from 94 that says for fixed 
epsilon bigger than zero, then with finitely many exceptions, every congruence arithmetic well, surface group, or I'll just say G because it's the same Gs we've been considering so far. Every congruence arithmetic G has a fine, a, an index 2 subgroup with lambda 1 of that group less than epsilon. So notice all of these congruence things, they have their lambda 1s bounded below by this, which is likely much, much bigger than epsilon. And so the way this was originally couched is, OK, if you throw out the low genus examples, then for sufficiently high genus surfaces, every surface has a degree 2 cover where the lambda 1, and hence the Chiga constant, so Chiga constant going to 0. So I find this kind of interesting. And in particular, I kind of want to see how this happens. So when I first saw this theorem, I thought, can you draw me a picture? And I, I couldn't see one, so I came up with this cartoon. So take a genus 2 surface, which has two short curves that help separate, and then one less short curve that helps separate. So these are meant to be short, and then the red one is going to be not necessarily short. So the point is, this one doesn't have necessarily a small Chiga constant. It has a couple of curves that are pretty short, but it doesn't have a separating collection of very short curves. Well, then this surface has a degree 2 cover that you get by cutting open the red curve. And it's going to look like this. Oop, getting a bit optimistic there. So now the red curve has been lifted to a pair of curves like this. And there are now four short curves. And so because the green curves now separate this surface, this is going to have a very small Chiga constant. And this one didn't necessarily. So here you have the group here, possibly congruence, possibly having a fairly big lambda 1 and a fairly big Chiga constant, and an index 2 subgroup, or a degree 2 cover, where the Chiga constant drops dramatically. So this is the cartoon I came up with. And the question is, is this really what happens? Does this type of thing happen in our examples? If so, how? OK, questions at this point. OK, so now. These are the questions that we want to address, essentially. How do we address them? Well, you go looking for what Brian calls Chiga minimizers. So the definition of this is that a two-dimensional Chiga minimizer is a subset a of your surface M, such that the area of A is less than the, or less than or equal to the area of M over 2, and the length of the boundary of A over the area of A, which he calls H star of A, actually realizes the Chiga constant. Okay. So this is saying the Chiga constant is defined as an infimum. So it's theoretically possible that you never actually realize the Chiga constant. You just look at a sequence of subsurfaces and unions of geodesics that create things which go to zero, say. Well, this, if the existence of a Chiga minimizer would preclude that. 
it would say we actually realize the Chica constant. So we want to be able to say that such a thing exists. Um, in this situation, we say that the boundary of A is a one-dimensional Chigo minimizer. Adams and Morgan from 99, which says for M connected and geometrically finite hyperbolic surface, any collection of embedded curves Bounding a region A of area T with the length of the boundary being minimal well the theorem is that only four things can happen So one of them is you have a metric disk. Uh, the second thing is you have a horocusp neighborhood. The third thing is, well, I'm just going to draw a picture of this. I'm not going to, to write it because I'm running short of time. What you have is an annulus where well, you take a geodesic, a closed geodesic, and you look at the equidistant curves that are exactly the same distance away on either side. And then the fourth thing is a union of geodesics or curves all equidistant from their isotopic geodesics. So I guess what this theorem is saying is, suppose you have a subsurface A of area T of length, whatever the boundary length is, and it's not one of these forms, well then you can somehow deform the boundary, keeping the area constant, to get into one of these four forms. And the most remarkable one of these I find is this one. So what this is saying is, uh, the picture here is, suppose you have this surface here where you have a, uh, one piece of genus here and then you've got two of these. And then you, let's say you've got extra genus over here. Well, what this is saying is, let's say the geodesic, uh, the two geodesic um, things here are kind of close to this end. Well, then, If you choose a subset with area bigger than the area of this twice punctured torus, like this, then what's going to happen is the way to minimize the length of the boundary with that area is going to be to find the curves that are both equidistant from their isotopic geodesics and take the twice punctured torus together with those neighborhoods. So the point is these distances here have to match. So this is nice. It actually makes it easier to find the Chiga constant because you don't have to worry about extending this distance d1 and this distance d2 into the other subsurface. You only have to go the same distance either, either way. So we're looking for things like this, and then the theorem that Brian proved last year says that 
Firstly, as long as you're a connected geometri geometrically finite hyperbolic surface, then you're always going to have a Cheeger minimizer. It's going to be of one of these forms. And in particular, if you're a metric disk, that only happens in the case when the surface is compact and the area of the disk is exactly half the area of the surface. This case only happens when your surface is compact and the area of this annulus is exactly half the area of the surface. And so since we're non-compact, we only have to worry about this one and this one. So th there's a more detailed theorem here, but I'm going to summarize it by saying when, N, when M is non-co-compact, since I'm short of time, I'll just summarize this. I'll say you only have to worry about case two and case four. And the key is that a Cheeger minimizer does exist. So there's a lot going on, and the, uh, this paper is, uh, there's a lot of machinery in this paper to prove that this is in fact the case. Um, I could try to say something about the analysis involved, but I think I'm going to skip it. I'll, I'm happy to try to answer questions about the analysis of how this works later, but I'm not an expert in that, and I want to get to the examples. So unless there are questions, I want to skip ahead. Okay. so. Let's work some examples. OK, so what this theorem says is we only have to worry about horocusp neighborhoods and GUD6, unions of GUD6, and equidistant curves from GUD6. Great thing about horocusp neighborhoods, so these are things that on your surface look like this. They have a Cheeger ratio of exactly 1 because the length of the curve that goes around the cusp is exactly the area that that thing encloses. So for a cusp neighborhood, A, H star of A is equal to 1. So that automatically gives you an upper bound on the Cheeger constant. So the length of this to the ratio to the area that it encloses, that gives you an upper bound of 1. So non-compactness is actually helping us here. And what this then does is it gives you an upper bound on the combined length of GUD6 in case 4 of the area of the surface over 2. Because the largest that the minimum of the areas of the two pieces can be is the area over 2 if they're both exactly half the area. And the, uh, therefore, if we have a union of geodesics of length bigger than the area over 2, the corresponding Cheeger ratio is going to be bigger than 1. So that actually gives you finitely many curves to check. So hence, we only enumerate geodesics of length less than or equal to the area of M over 2. So that is essentially why there exists an algorithm. If, if we didn't have a bound like this, we'd theoretically have to check infinitely many different curves. But because we have this bound, we only have finitely many geodesics of length less than the area over 2. And so we can run an algorithm. OK, so the first example I want to work is the normalizer of gamma 0 over 11. So this has a fundamental, fundamental domain that looks something like this. And in this case, I have two sides that are glued here. I have a parabolic gluing these two sides here, and I have um, involutions 
acting on these three sides. So this is actually not a reflection group because it's not true that everything is paired symmetrically. So this is one of my eight examples. In this case, what I have is I have a geodesic here, which corresponds to an element with trace square root of 11. And if I glue this up and I look at the resulting surface, it looks something like this. And so this geodesic here is going to be this one here. And what it does is it actually cuts the surface exactly in half. The two pieces are areas pi and pi. So uh, this has length, arc cosh of root 11 over 2. And then the area of the smaller piece is pi, because they're both area pi. And so this actually gives you uh, the Chiga constant being 0.695394. And it turns out you can't do any better. The, actually, in this particular group, the only trace smaller than root 11 that can appear is a trace of 3. There is actually an element of trace 3. But when you look at the element of trace 3, it, you find it has an axis that does something like this. And what that actually ends up meaning is when you project down to the surface, it's not a closed geodesic. It's a geodesic arc between two cone points. So that doesn't enclose anything. So you do have to be careful and argue that there are no other geodesic arcs in the surface that together with this one enclose a subsurface. But you can check that. And this is, in fact, the Chiga constant of this example. Now, how do you get the index 2 subgroup? Well, it turns out you basically have to find an index 2 subgroup that doesn't include these involutions. And when you do that, you have a fundamental, fundamental domain that looks something like this. And that turns out to be a reflection group. Because it turns out everything is going to get paired exactly symmetrically. So this is going to correspond to a reflection group. And it's also going to correspond to a degree 2 cover of this thing. And it turns out the degree 2 cover that you get is exactly the, the cover you get if you cut open along this green curve and then take two copies and glue. So the cover that you get looks exactly like this. You now have this thing here, which wasn't a closed geodesic before, but is a closed geodesic now. You still have two lifts of this curve. But this is now a shorter curve that separates this new surface into two pieces of equal area. And so this thing here, this is length uh, 2 times, uh, this should be a 2 there, sorry, 2 arc cosh 3 over 2. And then the area of each of these pieces is actually 2 pi. And the Chiga constant of this is 0 0.306349. So the Chiga constant drops by more than half because there's this hidden thing here which wasn't a geodesic in the maximal surface but lifts to a geodesic here, which is shorter than the ones you had up here. So that's one way in which the Chiga constant can drop sig significantly. Yeah? Where is this green arc in your fundamental domain? That's, it's, it's here. It's actually passing through. So here there was a uh, fixed point of an involution. It's passing through that, and then if you conjugate this involution by this involution, there's a fixed point here. And so it's actually not inside the front of the domain, but it's here. And so there's an axis that passes through these two cone points, and that projects down to the geodesic that goes through here. OK. I only have a, well, I probably don't have much time left, but I do want to say one more example. I'm just going to draw the surfaces here. One, two, three, four, five. So this is a surface with a cusp and five cone points. It has area three pi. And it turns out, sorry, if you just give me one more minute, you'll never be able to cut this surface into two pieces of equal area. 
because the pieces would have to have area 3 pi over 2, but there's no hyperbolic surface that has that area. So what you end up doing is looking at this thing, which has length corresponding to trace square root of 17. And you end up taking equidistant curves. So this is an interesting example because it's an example where the Chiga constant actually is realized by a non-geodesic and a non horocusp You actually have this equidistant curve. So this is poorly drawn because this is meant to be projecting equal area into, uh, into down here. And here, the uh, Chiga constant, uh, that's on my other piece of paper, is 0.663522. And there's a degree two cover, which I won't draw, where the Chiga constant only drops to 0.489333. So here, the Chiga constant doesn't drop dramatically. And it won't surprise you to learn that this example corresponds to an example here, which is congruence. So here, this example wasn't congruence. The Chiga constant dropped quite dramatically. Here, the Chiga constant didn't drop dramatically. And the uh, corresponding surface is congruence. So I have more data, but I think this is probably a good place to stop. So thank you. So you found index two subgroup where the Shiger constant drops significantly here. Yes. And according to was it Sarnak's result that? The, yeah. Uh, so is there? Um, so did, is this the best you can do, like for this? Particular yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. So this is yeah, this is not necessarily the best you can do. I'm not looking for the index two subgroup uh -huh. where lambda one or the Shiger constant uh -huh. drops most dramatically. Uh -huh. But it is interesting that these natural subgroups to look at for other reasons exhibit this sort of general behavior where if the subgroup happens to not be congruent, then the Chiga constant seems to drop more dramatically. And that's, yeah, that's an interesting question that hopefully we will know more about soon. All right. Thank you very much again.